At Green Bay's first home game of the season, the Packers bring Wisconsin's red and blue voters together. Three and a half hours every single week, people put their political needs aside and they just want to cheer for the green and gold. It can take people from either side of the political spectrum and bring them together. Packers, of course, Packers. But even at Lambeau Field, political divisions calcified by a decade of tribal politics are impossible to escape. In an election year like this, you can kind of feel it in groups of people, maybe a little bit of tension if they know that someone's on the opposite side of the political spectrum. Sure, I have a political divide in my own family if, if we talk politics. Some people in my friend group uh, have left our, our group just based on like, uh, like political views. Not a year goes by without at least one statewide race dividing Wisconsin. And 2022 is no different as the state hosts two nationally watched nail biters with both the Senate and governor races up for grabs and on a knife's edge. What's unclear about this divide is whether the state even has many voters who vacillate between the two parties. In Wisconsin, the majority of swing voters appear to be those folks who swing between voting and not voting. While four of the last six presidential elections here in Wisconsin were decided by less than a percentage point, Wisconsin is less a purple state than it is two states in one. In fact, in 2020, just nine of the state's 72 counties were decided by less than five percentage points. That number has been cut in half since 2000. Overall, it's been nearly 25 years since a Senate and governor candidate from different parties won on the same ballot, with voters splitting their tickets. Democrat Lena Taylor has been a state senator since 2005. She's been in the majority twice, the minority seven times. Mm -hmm. I think about Tommy Thompson. Now, those were really, arguably now, right, the good old days. It's when there was a Republican governor and a Democratic legislature. I believe divided government also creates a different way. That you noticed it these changed. four years? It's the difference between do I listen to you, do I work with you, or do I bring you a takeout meal and tell you this is what we're having? America is very polarized, in some ways calcified. Um, Wisconsin, patient zero. Do you accept that? Yeah, I mean, I think you look back, even before I was in office, you go back to 2000, the difference between George W. Bush and Al Gore, and then four years later between Bush and Kerry, was less than one vote per ward on average. Wisconsin had been almost perfectly even divided for now decades. Those divisions deepened in 2011 when then-Wisconsin Republican Governor Scott Walker became the first governor in nearly a decade to face a recall election after he angered labor unions and Democrats with a law called Act 10, stripping public sector unions of most of their bargaining power. Let's go back to 2011. Yeah. And if I told you Donald Trump's going to hijack the Republican Party in six years, okay, would you have done some things differently? I think in terms of doing things, no. I mean, uh, I come from a state that overwhelmingly leans blue, occasionally is purple. And so part of the reason why we took the actions we did as quickly as we did is we didn't know how long we'd have. So we acted right away. And then once we got success, we kept reinvesting it, reinvesting it, reinvesting. It created a lot of turmoil early on and obviously led to my recall election, which was unsuccessful. Lena Taylor was one of the 14 Democratic state senators who left the state to deny Republicans a quorum on the Walker bill, repealing collective bargaining on benefits for public employees. At this juncture, I can't tell you, you know, that we're, that we're going home today. And I can't tell you we're going home tomorrow. Look at where we are today in the country. This looks like small potatoes, what you guys it, are engaging in, doesn't it? Completely. I mean, literally, one of the things that Scott Walker used to say is he couldn't even see the grass outside of his window, mm -hmm. you know. Because um, of the protesters, was, yeah. Exactly. Nowadays, you go from protesters who were peacefully protesting in 2010, right, to what we saw on January 6th. I can't tell you that I would have ever imagined, right, that something could be more divisive. I remember sitting on the finance committee and putting my arm on the table and my colleague, who was a Republican, not wanting my arm and his arm to touch. That just that tense? It was that tense. I was in college at the time, so... I sat down with a group of independent voters in Waukesha to hear how they had felt at the time as the recall divided families. But amazed at how families were willing to abandon each other because, oh, you're on this side of an issue in, in a way that 
I hadn't experienced before in life. I think it was almost like the, the spark, if you will. Did it go to another level when Trump came, in the, came into the state? Oh, you know, absolutely. Trumpism? It was, it was a game changer. Um, so, you know, friends that were friends for years, all of a sudden we stopped talking to one another. You know, family get-togethers became a bit more strained as you felt out each other. You felt out your own parents, like, well, how did you vote and why? And um, the emotions were at an all-time high. The widening gulf between the two parties exposed here during that bitterly fought recall foreshadowed the polarization that has come to define American politics today. Charles Franklin has been the director of the state's gold standard Marquette Law School poll since its inception a decade ago. We saw uh, the Tea Party wave in 2010 sweep out unified Democratic control, replace it with unified Republican control. And that unified control for Republicans gave them the opportunity to introduce some really major policy changes mm -hmm. that were hugely controversial. And so the state polarized in a way after 2011 that it had largely not been polarized in earlier years. Mm -hmm. The growing radicalization of the Republican Party and the divisions between the two parties that define national politics have been a part of Wisconsin's political experience for a decade. Central to Wisconsin's polarization is the urban-rural divide, with Dane County, home to Madison, producing huge margins for Democrats. Milwaukee, also a Democratic stronghold. But in rural Wisconsin, from 2000 to 2020, the Republican advantage in the presidential election grew from less than three points to nearly 20. And that divide is something Republican campaigns are trying to exploit for political gain in 2022 by focusing on crime and attempting to make Milwaukee a negative. Mandela Barnes, wrong on crime, dangerous for Wisconsin. Elevating the 2020 Kenosha protests after the police shooting of Jacob Blake and last year's Waukesha parade attack to prominent political symbols, trying to capitalize on a whose side are you on style of politics with race, the not-so-subtle subtext. Before Trump's victory in 2016 by just 22,000 votes, Wisconsin had not voted for a Republican presidential nominee since 1984. He built on a growth in the white working class that was already there. And that trend started during the Walker era predating Trump. Trump built on that and further increased his strength with working class voters. So let's talk about Trump for a second because you you made a, I still think about your press conference yeah. when you announced that you were leaving the race and you were leaving the race with a specific reason uh, and was to stop Donald Trump. And you never said his name, right. but it was obvious what you were doing. You weren't hiding it. You seemed to understand he was a threat. Did you know what kind of threat he would be to the party? And what were you worried about? At well, two part. I, I remember uh, in 2020 saying it on your show and I was in lacrosse uh, when you asked a similar question. And I said, I didn't know that he'd be a conservative. I mean, I was first that, of all, at that time. That's what right. You were I was worried. Well, I said well, there needs to be a positive conservative alternative right. to the front runner. Didn't say his name because I didn't know he never he never run for office. He never held office. I was surprised in a good way as to how effective he was on policy. I was surprised similarly in a not so good way when I realized that some of that erosion you talk about, uh, particularly in the suburbs of Milwaukee outside of Milwaukee County, are because of the tone. Uh, the, the not only women, but college educated men and women who just didn't like the tone, even though they liked the substance. When Wisconsin flipped in 2020 from a Trump state to a Biden state, just two of the state's 72 counties actually flipped red to blue, meaning it all came down to margins, including here in Waukesha, a red suburban county around Milwaukee. Democrats made slight but meaningful gains, and it's those gains that won them the state in 2020. Wisconsin has also been ground zero for Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the election. Under pressure from Trump, Republican Assembly Speaker Robin Voss hired former state Supreme Court Justice Michael Gableman to conduct a 14-month probe into the 2020 election results. Voss ultimately called Gableman an embarrassment and fired him. Gableman and Trump supported a primary challenger to Voss, who Voss beat by just 260 votes. Adam Steen is running to defeat your rhino Speaker of the House, Robin Voss. I know what it's like to go through a tough primary, right? I mean, I know what it's yes, like to do. have to, you know, battle for what you believe and sometimes even with your friends, have them not necessarily, you know, walk away thinking you're the right answer. There are some people that say, Robin Voss, 
He, he's put his political career on the line. He stood up to Trump. And there are others that are saying his political career is on the line because he didn't stand up to Trump strong enough. Yeah, what critique do you accept? Yeah, I mean, that, well, they're, they're all valid, right? That's mm -hmm. what everybody has the right to their own opinion. Um, what I think that elected officials should do is do what they think is right. And sometimes that means going against your party. Most of the time, not. You know, look, Donald Trump did a lot of good for our party. Um, he brought a lot of new people in, a lot of energy. Um, but now we need to make sure we focus on winning this time around. And then we'll talk about 2024. But he's not on the ballot, shouldn't be. I jokingly tell him all the time that he used to be the extreme in his party, and now he's moderate. <laughs> Um, I will say that I think he probably didn't expect to get um, primaried from Trump. In the end, I think, though, it is a reflection of the lack of control that I think the Republican Party has of all of the people under their umbrella. You know, and I think that Robin um, doesn't have control of that group of people. What was your reaction to January 6th? Tweeted out pictures of the protests that had took place in you a couple days after January 6th. Do you think they were the same? Well, there were some similarities. To be clear, the day of, I commented, denounced outright. In fact, I actually made a point saying, if you're going to, if like I did, if you denounce what happened with the riots uh, in places like Portland and Kenosha and Madison, you should denounce that as well. And I still say to this day, anyone who was criminally involved in activity should be prosecuted. I think it should have been done more quickly, uh, but I think without a doubt it should have been. But when I look at the larger issue of not just the people who were in the Capitol, but around that area, I said there was a lot of similarities to what happened. The only difference was it wasn't hours in my case. It was literally weeks, almost a month, that they occupied our state capital. Does Wisconsin heal before the country, or does the country have to heal for Wisconsin to heal? Uh, I can't say. What would it take for either or both of the parties to be a little less homogeneous mm -hmm. and a little more diverse in their ideology, in their attachment to candidates. This is where that calcification concept, I think, yeah. does pay off, that it's very difficult for leaders in either party to really shift the lay of the land right now. Mm -hmm. The one caveat I would say is think about how much Donald Trump changed the Republican Party in the last six years. Meaning and somebody could do it in another state. Exactly. Let's, let's not yeah. be quite so myopic that we think this is the way it will always be. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.